busy day for everyone. <laughs> so welcome to Jared's on the second Saturday of March. And let's see. I guess this is the house appointment. So I will entertain class, you know, questions about that too. But mostly it's about the workings, because that seems to be trending very So my name is Betsy Kelson, and I am the staff horticulturist here at Jarrett's. And um, if my recollection is correct, let's see, I started here in 98. So I think this is the beginning of my 27th year at Jarrett's. Um, started out in the perennial area and just kind of got used to the whole place. <laughs> so. Uh, but in the last couple of years, um, you guys have probably noticed how many orchids there are out there in the world. And if you haven't, someone's probably gifted you one, or they've given you one that they think they're killing, but they know that you're a plant nerd and that you'll save it. So how many are in those boats? Okay. Um, because the next. The next place that has open space has no fan, and it's even hotter than here. So, <laughs> so if you need to move back further in the shade, be my guest. Um, so how many of you have, have orchids that are in really good shape? Okay, and how many of you have orchids that are maybe not in as good a shape as you think they should be? Okay, and if you don't have orchids yet, then you know hopefully, um, you'll be inspired to you know, start one again. I had some orchids probably, I can't see, probably 40 years ago. And I had been, had a trip to Florida where you know, it's sort of like orchid heaven there. I mean, you know how we put hanging baskets out of petunias and things like that? I mean, their trees are loaded with baskets of orchids. So, you know, their hanging baskets are just completely different from ours because they can live out there absolutely perfect with very little uh, problems. Um, but at one time, so, you know, that was my first plants that I had. And, and there was a place called the Orchid Jungle down there in, in Central Florida. And you could buy a little start of orchids. You know, we're talking, the leaves are probably a quarter of this size. Three of them, 10 bucks. Not blooming. I mean, we're talking big orchids. And that was kind of, for me, it was sort of like, well, hey, so there, I'm going to pay 10 bucks, great. You know, the cats decided it was something to nosh on. <laughs> So it was either get rid of the cats or get, or get rid of the orchids, so the orchids lost. But then as more and more people got interested in orchids because they have figured out, much like they do some of our other plant materials that we see in huge numbers in the market, they are, have figured out how to do cuttings off of them, how to get them to grow maximally, so with, with little inputs. Um, they use tissue culture so that they can have thousands of plants from just a little bit of a piece of plant material. And the price is within the average man's pocketbook. Because several of you, I can tell, you know, are around my age. And you remember Family Affair with Buffy and Jody and Mr. French. And what did Mr. French do on his days off? He played with orchids. And they were a rich man's plant. And you know, it was just like tulip me. But now, I mean, you're lucky. You can get 10, 20, $30 orchids. And how long do they usually bloom if everything's, I mean, how many have a house plant that will bloom for three months to six months? No problem. That is like the beauty of the orchids. Now, I was fortunate enough, because, because we were getting more and more people in asking about orchids, that I thought, okay, I need to go out and really take a class and learn how to do this. Thing. 
So the lady that I took classes with, she's from Conifer. Of all places. It's a great place. It's a, she has a room <laughs> that she dedicates to her orchids. Much like if you've ever listened to the Garden Pros in the morning on um, Legends 810, Keith Funk is an orchid door. He, his entire basement is plants that he either brings through the winter down there so he can repurpose them out in his garden, or they are his orchid porch. Lights, humidity, you know, all the bells and whistles that it takes to get not only the Phalaenopsis orchid to go, but some of the more challenging ones that need warmer temperatures, more humidity than an average home. So there is hope. So I thought, huh? It's all about light. And the thing is that the light, and because her house is probably like mine, I have, my, because I was going to give these classes, I actually had to go out and buy an orchid. So I kind of knew what I, you know, was kind of doing. So my first baby was this guy. And he's only got two leaves. But when I had him, I mean, he had these beautiful flowers, the, what we call the moth wings. That's my first teacher. I was inspired enough when she said the temperatures for these plants can go down 50 degrees. And when you have a house that's on wood burning only in the winter, there are plants that I cannot grow or are afraid to grow because my house is too cold. So I started off with the moth burns. And you can see here, you know, the light isn't all that. It just needs to be bright. So most of us have a north, have a north that is bright in the summertime because the, you know, the sun has come up over the house. But in the wintertime, it's probably a little too dark. So your orchid would need to go into a brighter window for the winter so that it can enjoy you know, that nine hours that we have in the summer. But the east, the west afternoon sun, and possibly the full sun, but on either side of a south window in the winter, are fine for orchids. The other thing is the temperature. And like I said, my house can, you know, at night can go drop down into the 50s. And um, so these guys, you know, like a 60 degree temperature at night, but I have taken mine down below that and not seen any signs when I hit that 50 to 55. There's a seat over there if you want one over there. Yeah. You obviously <laughs> don't do a wood order, do you? <laughs> yeah, you, you usually just kind of cocoon in the two rooms, okay, in the wintertime. Um, now, there are other orchids that are out there in the world that I have had come across um, my planting area, and that is the Vendobian. So you can see the structure of the leaves and the look of it are a lot different. They're more upright and they, to me, they kind of grow like irises. So you can see from this picture sketch that, you know, there's like two of them attached. So if they get to growing well, they can, um, you can actually split them and have two plants. So this one's really easy to propagate into two children with the same parentage. But if you look at this, their temperatures, they don't want to fall between 55 and 60, but they can take a little bit higher temperatures than the others. And you can also see that humidity is a real key on this one too. This one wants humidity between 30 and 60%. And back to our um, moth, it can take 50 to 80, but I will tell you, my house is probably about, at least in the wood burning room, is about um, maybe 15%. So what I do is I get a saucer. I would get a saucer and put pebbles on it, and then put the plant on top of the pebbles and always keep water on the pebbles so that as it evaporates, 
you'll create the humidity around your plants. But if you're adding your orchid in with your other house plants, they're all sharing that humidity as a good off. But sometimes I think the cats drink the water out of my humidity trays. So um, sometimes they'll get it'll get really bone dry, but it doesn't seem to really affect my orchids. But I think they would be um, a little healthier looking if I didn't stress them so much. But what about spraying? Spraying them? You know, because we are so dry, I mean, you know, if you can ride on your skin, we're at 10%. <laughs> so you would have to mist like every 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. We don't have that kind of time, which is why, you know, humidifiers help adding extra water into saucers so that as it evaporates, you know, it seems to be more um, efficient. Any questions about some of the the cool stuff that's out there? Now, I, I sent that dendrobium around. You rarely see that like in grocery stores. You know, at King Supers and Safeway, they always have beautiful, beautiful orchids, but they are all pretty much the Phalaenopsis moth orchid just because they're the ones that are more forgiving than anything else. Sometimes I've seen it there's a lot of Yeah, so if you get the same one, yeah, it's just an old one. And because the house is probably moister than you think it is, so they're pretty, if they don't, if they come out and they're nice and, so on that one on that dendrobian, you can see that there's, uh, below the leaves, there's like little notches where leaves used to be. Sometimes if it's humid enough, they will produce more leaves from there or they'll produce more roots. So if they stay nice and white and they don't try and dry up right away, the humidity is enough. Talking about the roots coming out? Yeah, the roots will be white when they come out of these guys. And so if you see them kind of getting like little brown tips or going or looking a little shrunken, mm -hmm. you'll want to miss them that. Okay. Thank you. But you know, with our heavy water that comes out of our tap. Um, you're more likely by misting leaves and roots is to have a, a salt buildup on them that will make the root turn brown. So on this one that's been around a while, what you're really shooting for are nice green to slightly silver coated leaves. So those leaves and the roots, see how those roots are kind of got a silver mask over the top of them? You can see the old ones, they're kind of about that brown thing. That's the salt roll up from our well water. I would say so because what's coming out of the tap is a nine, and most of our house plants like it about neutral. So neutral is seven. So being that it's coming out of the tap is a nine pH, that's a hundred times more alkaline. It's an exponential thing. So you can see where. Green, yeah, so a lot of times, we, you know, if you're a visual person, the watering is usually, um, back up, so I'm going to water here, and it should, so when you're getting ready, there's a couple ways to water. I usually put it in a bowl in my kitchen sink, and I'll use the sprayer to take the dust off the leaves, and I will use tepid water, not cold water. And I will start at the top, and as, as you water, you'll see it turn from that silver green to the bright green of a hydrated plant root and plant shoot. And I will usually fill it up and set a timer for 20 minutes. Now the 20 minutes is just my number um, because I can be a forgetful plant parent, especially when we get really busy at work. And this time of year, they're lucky to get a watering three times once every three weeks because my house is so good. Now, if you're using this kind of material, you pass that around, or this new one that I got that I haven't. But these bark products tend to drain really, really quickly, so your plants aren't going to get waterlogged. 
And if you're a once a week watering person of your other house plants, as well as your orchids, this is probably the one that you'll want to use because it drains quickly. But I always give them a chance to kind of suck it up if they've gotten a little on the dry side. Now at one time, I thought, what about this one? Does it say real moist on this one? It says that it drains quickly, but I feel moist. Yeah. <coughs> Is this a coconut? This one is a soft wood bark that's been processed. So it's more, it's a little more shreddy. And we were getting desperate for working soil, so this is what we were trying to find. I prefer the one in the other cup that's going around that's got little bits of bark. It's got little bits of spag and peat moss. It's got charcoal. And believe it or not, it's got lava rock. So when you're getting ready to transplant that, I would save the charcoal and the lava rock and then throw the rest of the stuff away. Because lava rock is the most expensive portion of the stuff that you're doing. And when I went to that place in Florida, most of their stuff was grown in lava rock. So yeah. So this, this and this is what I would pull out, is the charcoal. It wouldn't be getting ready to transplant because this material has broken down so much that it's moving and it's time to replant your orchard. Now at one time, this other stuff that I'm passing around, the little bag of big moss pellets, mm -hmm. it seemed like for many, many years that these um, Orchids that we were seeing in the stores had this stuff in it, this material, and I thought it was just for ease of shipping because it wasn't as heavy, um, that it was something that they could sterilize because it was coming out of country and not want to introduce nasty stuff into our material, that it was something that they could sterilize. But um, you know how. It, you remember the, the, old, the old adage, you learn something new every day? About six months ago, I was reading that this stuff, if you tend to be a forgetful plant here, this stuff, you don't have to water your orchids more than once every two weeks because this holds the moisture long. So if you travel a lot or you're not sure if it's going to come in and take care of your plants when you're on your trips, you might want to use this stuff so that you're not having to water as often. This one, it's like those sponges that you get. Once it gets watered, it puffs up to like three times its size and you can kind of tuck it into the root system that you're transplanting. But I have one of my babies that I keep in that. He's not doing too bad. He's got nice green roots. But you can see it's just fat and peat moss. He gets watered every other week during, during the warmer season. Do you break that stuff up? Yeah, you just kind of crush it up and mm -hmm. slightly tuck it back into the roots. Yeah, this is, a, and a lot of times they, they will bring them in like that. Well, that came to me about five years ago on, on my desk at work at Christmas time. It was a surprise. And it has never stopped bleeding until this year. Mm -hmm. And for five years, I've yeah. never been able to transplant it. Yeah, I would do that too. I need, while that's going around so you guys can feel the spang of peat moss, I need to go get my pruner so I can clean up her uh, orchids and she got it. Yeah, it's a surprise. So I'll be right back.
I even have a friend who does hers in pure water. Mm. No dirt. Uh, can you put water in it? You know, you can. I mean, they're, especially if it's a non-draining pot. So this one, surprisingly, um, no, it, just, it just has one hole in the bottom. It doesn't even have, and even this guy has a hole in the bottom just in case. But a lot of times they'll come, you know, kind of nest it in there without a hole, mm -hmm. in which case, I mean, you could just <coughs> fill up that container, let it set for the amount of minutes that you think it's going to take yours to hydrate, and then just tip it out and just leave the rest. Now, everything I tell you, people have been in this class bringing me their little orchid babies, and there's exceptions to all those rules. I have pulled beautiful plants out of a pot that is stand with the water standing, and she does that all the time, and the plant does fine. But then I'll pull the next one out where their leaves are all and it is standing in water, and all the roots are yuck. Um, I, you know, because I do mine this way, um, but you know, a lot of times you'll see the little tags that say use the ice cubes. And I will tell you, the ice cubes actually work if you use another. Like, but see, two may not be enough, because if you get one like this, I mean, you can put like six of them. But I have had folks bring them to me where they're only doing one ice cube. This side of the root ball is gorgeous. The roots are kind of, the, the plant leaves are kind of shaky. This side is bone dry and every single root is dead because the water didn't go this way. It went straight down and watered everything. And I've had customers come in and, and plant orchid people and they love the convenience of the ice cubes because it's not melting at 32 degrees. They've done the tests and it's like 43 degrees when it goes into the root system. So much like yours, that would not stop blooming. This one would not stop blooming for four years. And then it rested and then it started again. And right now it's, I'm hoping if I can keep this thing attached keeping moving it back and forth for classes that I'm not going to lose the growing point. Yes? So once your orchid stops blooming, mm -hmm. do you like cut off that stem because it looked like it was done? If or it is, keep it? if the flower spike starts to turn that kind of straw colored beige, that part is dead. But oftentimes, You'll have, since no one brought me one, sometimes that flower spike will stay that nice kind of maroon color. And if you are patient enough and are very careful, because I missed up the first time, uh, it will actually put out a new flower spike somewhere along there to start the whole process again. And I got a little too anxious during a class and I went down, you know, starting with the leaves and counted one or two of the little leaf scars where the where the new growth was gonna be and I cut and then where I cut there was a new spot. So yeah, so you gotta be really careful. And on this one, surprisingly, let's see, one of my babies actually see this one so this one is one of my new flower spikes but I think this might have gone to that three weeks without water and I killed the growing point but if you look really carefully down below there's a new a new right below where See, and it's very subtle. Usually, you know, they start looking, so here's like the, the scar. So what I did that first time is I did one, two, three, and I cut, and it was actually one of these, you know, 
this one because I killed the spike. All right. I think there's actually one under here. Yeah. It's to oh. yeah. And it's very, very subtle as to what looks like a boot and what looks like a shoot. So in this graphic, the one on the left is the root, and the one on the right, which looks almost the same, is the shoot. The one on the right is the shoot. So it almost looks like a little finger with a fingernail. And I think one of mine actually is doing Some of these are kind of nubby, like the one on your left in your, but see on this one how it's kind of looks like almost like a finger with a nail on it. It's, so this is like, so the one on the left is the root. This. So that is like this. So you see this one's kind of blunt. These are blunt. But if you look carefully at mine, it's not as one it's starting to get pointy. And it looks sort of like an electricity. And then that's your flower Really, it looks like a root. Yeah. Look how it looks like a root. Some people are starting to get pointy. Some people are starting to get pointy. Some people are starting to get pointy. Well, they can be. That's what, see, that's why I can see the one, I have my smaller one over there. Yeah. That yeah. they don't yeah. always want to go up. Yeah. I have some that. I had three flower spikes that had ten flowers on the beach and they were all silos. They were false. So it gets really so these are considered These roots. are the roots. Those are roots. And then this one, I don't know what that one's going to do. This one, it's not quite as stumpy, but it's almost got this little kind of like finger. Right. And it's not that it's dry at all. Right. And the other one had one that's going to dry at all. I had a question. When you were talking about ice cubes, so mm -hmm. you're talking about normal ice cubes. Normal ice cubes. Okay. And you just pop them in. There. You just you just set them on top of the roots oh, and then right. melt slowly yeah. in there and wet up that uh, material. So you can see these little stumpy guys, and, and then this one's got a point. It looks like it almost has like a finger in the side. And that's your flower spike. So on the other side, there's the stumpy. This one that has kind of like a big piece. And these, this picture, if you need a colored picture, most of this information comes off the, the American Orchid Society website. So, any questions? Who wants to run out and get orchids? It, it, I have to avoid yeah. that section. <laughs> anyway, none of my stuff is blooming right now. Talk about um, colors. Different. Well, I mean, I mean, some of them are naturally the color that they are, but if you get into crazy colors like blue, they have died. They've either put the, the chemical in through their root system so that it's throughout the plant for those flowers, or they've sprayed them. But I doubt they would spray them like they would like, like um, carnations. Yeah, because I don't think that they would toss it. But then your next flower spike is usually white. And then the way you guys to pin them up in the wild, do they just lay they on just, the ground? They just, they just, they just go down. down. So when when this little guy was no, it was this little guy that was blooming. He he just decided he wanted to go this way. Yeah. And so I had to find a place so I could enjoy him. So he lived in my kitchen for three months because he just kept going. And I think the reason you and I get got that many years of bloom before we could do anything, um, if you look at the Phalaenopsis thing where it says that you know it'll go down to 50 degrees, because my house is the way it is, and if you are putting your plants in a cooler part of the house, it thinks it's fall all the time. So they keep growing flower spikes. Exactly. And see mine, I have. 
you know, here's the wood stove, and then I have this in, this outset window that's like a little bay. And it's cooler and, in that And area. that's what, that's the only thing I can figure out, because I am not a heavy fertilizer user, but there are <coughs> fertilizers that the plant's not going to care, just make them very, very, very weak. So there's ones like this where it looks like an Alka-Seltzer pill that you dump in your water and makes a gallon's worth of stuff. And then there's the one where you can actually control like teaspoons per gallon and make it really weak and run that through while you're soaking. Can you use that? But my body's so highly mineralized, I don't even fertilize it. Can, can you use that fertilizer on other house plants? Absolutely. There's so, I mean, if we, if we have a fertilizer for everything that we have in our house, whether it's Talanzias or, you know, we would have 20 different products. Does the plant care? I really don't think so. I mean, my Talanzias, when it's time to soak them, they get soaked in um, miracle Grow from mere acid. So to keep, because they're soaking in a pH of 9, I want to drop that pH so that they're getting more of an acid just like natural. But I make it very weak. I mean, it's like if I was doing my orchids that I felt like they needed to be fertilized because my, my well water is so highly mineralized, they're getting enough. Um, I would probably do, you know, if I had a little jar, like a cup, that I was going to fertilize with, I would just put a pinch in. Because you can't take it away. If you overdo it, you can always add it. So I water mine. We have, I have reverse osmosis in my house. So my all my water is filtered. Is that... That's helping with that. Yeah, because that, that, that pH would probably be very, very neutral. But I'm seeing things happening in people's house plants that they've had them for years where the color isn't very good anymore. And the research isn't out there. They're actually looking at it this year after two years of having this nice pH water in our tap. I think, I think it's affecting the plants. Because most of our house plants want a pH of six and a half to seven and a half. And we're getting those in our So that can't keep them very So we know about the water, we know about the fertilizer, the material that we're going to be doing this with. Um, anything you want me to go over again? I don't want to keep you sweating here. I'm going to go home and eat toast <laughs> for the day. <laughs> Would you repeat again when they bloom? It's in the, was it in the fall? It's usually in the fall. Cooler? Yeah, they, they know when fall comes. So it's usually, and to force them like they do at where you see them all year round, it's probably something that they, you know, chill for a month. I've they, seen them in the coolers in the refrigerators. Yeah, like they fake a fall. Yep. Mm. And if I hadn't seen that happen to mine, I would have been like, oh, it's going to bloom for four years, which is not supposed to happen. Well, what's happening when one has a bloom for four or five years? How warm's your house? It's probably a lot of like years of winter and snow. There's big uh, windows around, yeah. but it's sitting probably 12 feet away from it. I would probably give it a little more light. See if just if you if you can get it in, you know, closer to the window where the light quality is going to be better. With the temperature, mine are in my. I have some in my east window. And some are actually in a room that um, it's actually south, but I have an overhang, so it gets good, bright, indirect light, and they bloom in there too. But you might just try, if the coolness is already there to, to cause it to do a flower spike, then it's probably a light issue, and I would move it closer. Because if it's 12 feet away from a window, that's probably not going to That's like a fly. perfect southern uh, south window. Yeah. And then there's another piece that comes right off into the street. Oh. Yeah. So there's windows around it. Mm -hmm. Surrounded by windows. And would you say that it's a bright indirect light? Yes. Okay. And I would probably start to fertilize it then and see if that's what's missing. Yeah. Like I said, my, my well water, I mean, it rock. Can we test that or do we have to take that to um, You could probably go to some place like GeoWater or you know a watering service that they, they could tell you. I 
think it might cost you a hundred bucks, but then you'd find out if you have radon or radiation. Jefferson County, yeah. Yeah, so if you've got good light and the temperatures are good and they're still not throwing um, water or, you know, throwing um, spikes, then it probably needs a little fertilizer. So seven is the, the ultimate. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, your, your, o, your, your OR water should help, distilled water should help. Um, sometimes letting the water sit out, but you want to make sure that you don't pour that last inch or two off because that's where everything settles out. And see if that helps too. Um, I'm not sure if anyone checked my little guys. This guy, he's my he's my poster child for abuse. <laughs> um, you know, it's been a long time since we've had like minus 20 winters around here. And so this guy was in the room furthest from the woods. And when we got that minus 20 degrees last winter, that went on for a week, um, all of a sudden all the orchids in that room started to show signs with um, lesions on their leaves, uh, burnt ends, and things like that. Now this one went through the second one, the one this year. And once again on that American Orchid Society, they have really good pictures of stuff that, you know, diseases that can happen to to our orchids, and I suspect that our orchids always have, you know, just like us, you know, there's there's diseases around all the time or within us that until we get weak, we don't get sick. The temperature in that room probably went down into the 40s, and 40s is the sweet spot for the diseases to start manifesting themselves, whereas the 50s don't, and that is what happened to a lot of them. So, Many of them are down to like two leaves because so many of the leaves were damaged in the last two years. You know, they'll come back. I always live in hope because my friend, my friend who had so many, she gets orchids on the clearance table, you know, and then she um, she fusses with them for a while, and then she wants to uh, she gets tired of them. So this one I had down to this leaf. She said, here, see if you can do something with this plant nerd. This is what your friends do, right? You're the better plant nerd. But it has gotten new leaves, new roots, and you know, it's doing fine. And it's in, yeah. So so being it's in the farm. Yeah. Now see, this is my only pot that I have with uh, that's a true orchid pot. And when I transplanted this, I had to find enough of the stuff that was in that soil to, to go over these holes so that the rest of the stuff would have, like, washed out. How'd you do that? I picked up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I literally, you know, found a piece and then, you know, and kind of filled the pot in as I went up until I had room for where the roots could go and then because some of those, so you holes, take them out of that plastic thing. There is no, yeah. So it, so this one, we can take them out of their plastic liners, and you can evaluate at that point. You know, is that stuff so yucky that it's no good and it needs to go out in the garden? And then you can evaluate the root systems to see if they need some help. So make sure that you have a sterilized pair of pruners when you're going from plant to plant, if you're getting into the planting mood, to redo everything, because you don't want to accidentally spread a disease from plant A to plant B. So if they are shrunken, or I mean, this looks like, you know, they're like dried up finger or something. Those are the ones, that was the one, that one for sure. So that one gets to go. Um, there have been some that have come in where they're, they're, it's almost like a tree where the roots are down here and this thing has pushed up out of the pot. And when I pull it out, everything from here that was in the pot is like what I just cut off. And then all of these new roots, you know, were kind of gently forced into the planting material but they kind of popped up too because it wasn't any room. 
But I literally could go in there where all that dead stuff was, because it's like a trunk, and cut that off. But see these, if you feel those, they, even though they mineralized water <coughs> kind of built up on the outside. So still nice and firm. Right yeah, that one. Yeah, that one. You get a cut that off. I probably will because I have something to substitute for it, but it's still pretty good. See, here's the original flower spike. And then this just goes right back in. And the, the coolest thing is, is you know how when we have our other house plants, we're always moving them up into the next size pot until we get to the pot that we can't move anymore? Yes. These guys, once you've kind of trimmed all the icky roots off, uh, you can sometimes you can put them right back into their original pot and it's okay. It's okay. And then you just tuck your soil, your material back in there. Kind of straighten it up if it wants to lean to one side or the other. And you may be done in our dry climate for another year or two. One more thing about the watering that I would caution you about. Try, if, you, if your plants have been soaking in the same water together, like you fill the sink and you put all of your orchids in there and everyone is fine, you can continue to do that with those. If you're introducing a new family member, I would suggest not adding it to the original plant. My friend James made that mistake. He killed everything because the newbie had a disease and it went to everything. So, so after a year or so you could do it? I would say so, yes. Yes. But yeah, don't introduce a new plant into your watering system because you may lose it. And it never occurred to me until he told that story. And he was a pretty good orchid grower. And I think he just got busy and forgot that that was a movie. Now, let's go with this little guy. Let me clean this up again. Yeah, using the orchid pots, the plants aren't going to really care if it's an orchid pot or not. Sometimes it's just a little more of a, a nice presentation. Um, you know, getting this out of here one of these days may be a challenge because it's starting to grow through. <laughs> what the holes were for. I think it's for aeration, so the mostly. Hang on there I think it's mostly for aeration. Because remember where these guys normally are adapted from? They're hanging out on tree limbs. Their roots are hanging out with nothing around them like dirt or sphagnum peat moss because it rains every day in the tropics. <laughs> or it's more humid than it is here. Uh, you, know, and, you know, there may come a time where you know, this little size pot or that one that this was in, you know, the roots are going to fit back in there, so it's time to move up into the next pot. Finding the next pot can be really a challenge. I know my friends up at Ector's have some four inch ones that have holes in the sides, but I think you have to buy like, you know, a hundred of them. I mean, how many, do you have a hundred friends that have orchids? Um, I usually send people to the deli. To the deli. And punch a hole in the bottom if you want to put some slits in the sides, fine. But you know, this could be the next size for one of my babies if they get too big. Because you can all you, we're always throwing this stuff away or reusing it for something. And so that may be the way to do it. Alright, so this little guy. I usually, I also like to leave my leaves on until they turn yellow because I kind of feel like they're still feeding the original plant. But a lot of times they'll just tear off really easy. And how, this is the one that you've had for years? Holy cow. 
That's why it needs to be transplanted. <laughs> oh my goodness. But look how healthy those roots are. Isn't that crazy? So would you recommend a bigger like pot for that? Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a baby coming out right there. taking the flat dead roots. Yeah. 